Hi everyone, welcome to Sacred Musings with me, Phil Saker. It's episode 43 today, it is the 14th of July 22, and today we are thinking about collectivism and individualism, we're thinking about some news, and we're looking at a reflection, finishing off Romans chapter 3. So welcome to the podcast today, everyone. Um, Just uh, one or two bits of news before we get into the main segment. So, um, yeah, uh, last week I was talking about how um, some friends of mine had stopped supporting me uh, on Sacred Musings because of of the political direction um, that they believed I was going in. And um, I kind of gave a little defence last week and I talked about that, uh, but I actually decided to write up my thoughts on my blog, which made a bit more coherent kind of sense, um, was a bit more um, together. So if you'd like to read that, it's an article on my blog, uh, Why Be Political? Uh, Defending Sacred Musings. And I'll put the link to that down below. Um, But I think that this is, it is important, you know, to be talking about these things as a Christian, uh, because that's because, you know, we do want to care about people. You know, that I think that's the whole thing about being a Christian, that we want to care and we want to do what's right and what's best. You know, this is actually really about what is right, uh, what is right and wrong. And that's something which is a very Christian thing, isn't it? Caring about what's right and wrong, caring about the truth. Um, so, for example, in the last the last week, it seems like a lot's happened. Um, but um, there was an article written by uh, Tim Dieppe in the Critic magazine, uh, Tim Dieppe from Christian Concern, who was talking about um, the the way that Hatton Tash, an, uh, an evangelist, a Christian evangelist, uh, who goes to Speaker's Corner every week, was brutally stabbed and, so, and there was an attempt on her life. And the police basically arrested her and didn't arrest the person who attacked her. And in fact, the the identity of the attacker is known to regulars at Speaker's Corner, but the police do not do anything and instead they arrested her. And I think that is a disgraceful, uh, being disgracefully partisan uh, from the police. Um, And this kind of thing is is sort of happening. And there is a similar story uh, with the the Telford grooming gangs. So there was a report that came out into the, the grooming gangs in Telford, and about how these um, grooming gangs had groomed over a thousand young working class white uh, girls and and sexually abused them. And the reason why the police didn't do didn't do anything is because of fear of being uh, racist or being accused of being racist, because it was evidence that the ones who were perpetrating this were uh, Muslim men, mainly of uh, Pakistani origin. So they didn't want to be considered racist. And I think, you know, these two things are a scandal to our country. You know how the um, the, Archb- uh, the Archbishop and the Bishops, the um, House of Bishops wrote a few weeks ago saying that the Rwanda plan shamed us as a nation. Well, in my opinion, I think this shames us as a nation. The idea that we would not do what is just and right because of the identity of the people who are perpetrating who are perpetrating these crimes that is disgraceful actually uh, that justice should be blind that we should have the same standards for everyone that's the point um, and and that i think this shames us as a nation more than sending a few asylum seekers to rwanda um, so you know it's it's massive uh, but also when it comes to the the covid stuff um, you know, I still think that, you know, a lot of people have kind of in their minds moved on from COVID. Um, but I think we, we can't do that. And there was a good article by um, Fraser Myers on Spiked this week talking about lockdowns and how that was Boris Johnson's legacy, which is not being talked about. And I think that it's interesting in the uh, the leadership, the Conservative Party sort of leadership elections that they're not really talking about the lockdowns at the moment. Um, so, you know, that's something which is uh, uh, seems to have been, you know, gone down the memory hole. Um, but even now, though, you know, when it comes to uh, issues maybe with the vaccine and issues with excess deaths, I was reading an article, for example, in the Daily Skeptic earlier saying that uh, excess deaths, which are not from COVID, have approached 9,000 in the last 10 weeks. So I think that's up until the beginning of July. 
and Steve Kirsch wrote a blog post on the 7th of July um, talking about the the um, safe and effective narrative falling apart and um, these looking at these um, non-COVID excess deaths. And even there was something on uh, Twitter from Claire Craig the other day saying that it had switched around that now. It was the case a couple of years ago that respiratory deaths were primary and uh, well, the, the, the bulk of it. And that, you know, um, heart disease, heart related death deaths were lower, but it switched round. And now that it's more, it's more the heart than respiratory. Uh, what's the cause of that? And, you know, if you put all of these things together, you think, you know, there could well be people dying as a result of a particular medical treatment, which I'm not going to name in case I get kicked off YouTube again. But it's it's this thing, isn't there, you know, that we're not going to name and talk about the elephant in the room because we don't want to be seen as being political. But we will, in the case of the bishops, as I said, we will talk about asylum seekers because that's acceptable to talk about. And I think, you know, who do we really care about here? Do we care about ourselves? Do we care from getting a pat on the back from the, the liberal establishment from the media? Or do we actually care about the truth and justice for people who do, are not getting justice? Because it seems to me that the asylum seekers have already got most of the media on board with, you know, on their side. No one is asking tough questions about that. But who is asking the tough questions about those thousand odd working class white world girls from Telford? Who is asking the questions about, you know, like Hassan Tash? Uh, who is you know, seeking justice for them? And uh, and who is seeking justice for people who've been like um, Vicky Spit, who was injured by the uh, whose um, uh, fiance uh, died after taking the AstraZeneca vaccine and um, and has only just received compensation. But there are many others in the same situation. You know, who is seeking justice for them? And this is where I think, you know, we just have got our sense of priorities all wrong. And this is why I think it's so important to speak up about this despite the fact that it might look like, you know, um, it might look like it's going down a particular political line, but that's only because everything is political at the moment. This is actually an attempt by, you know, for me, for myself, I need to, to speak the truth. And I hope that it's encouraging you to try and speak the truth as well and to try and look into uh, what is right and wrong and to actually be prepared to go to places which other people don't go to. And that's what Christianity calls us to, you know, to speak up for the rights of those who can't speak for themselves, to speak up for the rights of people who, who are being airbrushed out by the media. That is my Christian calling, I believe, and I hope that you see it in, in that same way too. And that's what I'm trying to talk about here. That's why I talk about it. So all of that, anyway, have a look at the my blog post about why a defence of why, why I do this, if you'd like a bit more um, sort of uh, coherence about that. Um, so all of that said now, let's move on to think about uh, collectivism, individualism, and what the Bible might have to say uh, about that. So in the main segment of Sacred Musings today, we're going to look at collectivism versus individualism. Now, this is a problem which has been around for as long as societies have been around. This is a problem that philosophers have been deba uh, debating for, for centuries, which is what, what is more important, the needs of the society or the needs of the individual? As I've put on there, what comes first, the one, you know, the individual, or the many, the society? And this is a, a big problem, of course, in human societies, and it's one which is come up quite a lot uh, recently which we'll come on to. So let's think first of all about how our rights do conflict. Let's just think of a few examples of conflicting rights because this happens all the time. So for example think about the right of smokers, the rights of someone to have a cigarette against the rights of people not to be affected by cigarette smoke. Now, I, for one, for example, am glad that, I mean, I'm not a smoker and I'm glad that in pubs and clubs, not that I really go into them anymore very much, but I'm glad that when I do, I don't come back home smelling like cigarette smoke. Um, I I'm, feel like my rights are upheld there. But I also do feel for my friends who 
uh, have to go outside to smoke a cigarette um, and you know that they uh, even when it's cold or raining they have to go outside in the cold and rain and you might think well good you know that's um, they're doing something which is antisocial but I think you know that that's a that's a value judgment, isn't it? You know, we have to balance those kind of rights. Who gets to decide? Or think about sticking with the the pub theme. Um, think about you know going and having a drink at a pub. Now, if you go and have a drink and then drive, you could be dangerous. And other people have a right not to you know, if they're walking walking home not to be hit by a drunk driver. So again, we have to kind of balance that in society that. Um, one person's behaviour could, you know, could really seriously impact someone else. And one which is um, a, a final one, which is obviously big at the moment, is free speech, uh, and particularly balancing the rights of free speech with the right, for example, not to be offended. Do people have a right not to be offended? Do the Muslims who protested against Our Lady of Heaven, for example, have the right to cancel the cinema screening that film because they are offended by that. And this is the problem, as you can see, that our rights conflict all the time. Almost everything we do has an impact on other people. So who gets to decide which rights take priority and how do we kind of make sense of all of this? So what is collectivism? Let's think about that. This is a, a definition from Britannica, the uh, online encyclopedia. Uh, collectivism, any of several types of social organisation in which the individual is seen as being subordinate to a social collect collectivity such as a state, a nation, a race or a social class. Collectivism may be contrasted with individualism, in which the rights and interests of the individual are emphasised. So they say that there is collectivism, which is where the individual is sort of subordinate to the group. And there's individualism, which prioritises the rights and the interests of the individual. And we have to kind of balance those, uh, those two things. They've, they go on to talk about how this has worked out in the 20th century. Collectivism has found varying degrees of expression in the 20th century in such movements as socialism, communism and fascism. The least collectivist of these is social democracy, which seeks to reduce the inequities of unrestrained capitalism by government regulation, redistribution of income and varying degrees of planning and public ownership. In communist systems, collectivism is carried to its furthest extreme, with a minimum of private ownership and a maximum of planned economy. So the communist system is the furthest down the collectivist line. If you like, you know, virtually nothing is owned privately and it has a kind of planned economy to try and redistribute wealth and so on. And that's not what we have, though. Not many countries have sort of fully gone down that line. What we have is social democracy, which is trying to balance some of the collectivist and individualist things, trying to as it says, uh, reduce the inequities of unrestrained capitalism by balancing that with government regulation and so on. So there is a recognition that uh, collectivism and individualism, there has to be a kind of midpoint between them. And you can't just have entirely one or entirely the other and have a functioning society. So what are the problems with individualism? Well, we were thinking a little bit about this last week uh, when we looked at Mike Ovi's address from GAFCON 2. And he said in that that we live in a very rights-based culture and our rights, our human rights, are applied at the level of the individual. So we think of ourselves in terms of having personal individual rights. But he also said that we don't have a corresponding understanding of our individual duties and responsibilities to others. Now we think of having rights for ourselves but we don't think of ourselves having duties to others. So that's one of the problems, uh, the main problem with individualism and um, I've given a couple of examples there, one of them being you know, my body my choice. Something you hear uh, pro-abortion activists say and what they are uh, basically saying is I should have the right to terminate a pregnancy if 
uh, if I believe it is inconvenient or wrong for me, um, that's my right to do that. And there's no consideration of the fact that the life inside the mother might have rights of its own. Uh, there's no responsibility, if you like, to actually consider that the mother might have a responsibility to to the the baby even when it's still in the womb. So it's just entirely on rights and no no understanding of uh, sort of competing rights or, or responsibilities. Um, a second example, you might think of something like money. Uh, money has come to be something which people think of entirely as uh, their own to, to do whatever they want with. You know, it's just for their, just for themselves. It's for them to have a nicer house or a nicer car or something and not to, to think about the benefit of others with. Um, so you think of all the people who play the lottery, for example, and have you ever heard a lottery winner saying, um, if, if they've asked, what are you going to do with the money? Then say, well, I'm going to give it all away. I'm going to give it all to charity and use this money to help other people improve their lives. Who says that? Who plays the lottery for that reason? You know, people want the money for themselves and that's how they're going to use it. And that's that's individualism. That's thinking that, you know, all of this belongs to me for myself to use. So there are problems with individualism, but I think there are also problems with collectivism. And I think that you can see that. Um, particularly with what's happened during COVID with mask wearing. I think mask wearing... Now, mask wearing is complicated because I I used mask wearing as an example last week, thinking about individuals. And I think that is true, that a lot of individuals think, well, I, I, don't, I don't feel safe if I see people not wearing a mask. And I think that's a sort of individualistic thing in some respects. But I think there is also a collectivist angle on this too. Um, so mask wearing was enforced by the law. You know, you didn't you didn't have a choice about wearing a mask unless you you know you claimed exemption, um, or you know you just had to break the law. Uh, it was ostensibly to protect others, um, despite the fact that there is a lack of scientific evidence, and despite the fact that masks themselves have harmful effects, um, physical but particularly psychological. It was, as we know from the behavioural scientists, they said it was a useful signal. This is what uh, Laura Dodsworth um, sort of um, said in her book, A State of Fear. Uh, she interviewed members of um, Spy B, for example, and, and it was the, the psychological effects that they were aiming for, really. Um, it was that instinct, that sort of collectivist instinct. And um, one of the, re the ways that masks do that is by very quickly identifying who's a team player and who isn't. You know, that if you see someone not wearing a mask, you think, ah, you're not a team player. You don't care about other people. And I think it, it actually hits on a lot of our most negative uh, human kind of um, emotions and, and relationships, you know, but ostracizing people who are not not playing according to, to the rules, not not, you know, taking one for the team, if you like. And I think that the masks are actually in some ways quite a good symbol for the the, the bad parts of, of collectivism, you know, because they the covering of faces, it's like that erasure of personal identity. Um, you weren't given a choice as to whether to wear a mask or not, especially that that's significant given the the lack of scientific evidence. Um, you, you couldn't just look at the evidence yourself and say, well, I think this is beneficial or I think this isn't beneficial. So no, you have to wear one to protect others. That's just what you have to do. It's the law. And you, you can't just decide what's best for others. You know, if you thought, for example, well, I think it's better not to wear a mask because I'm around children or because I'm, I'm around younger people who are less vulnerable or whatever, whatever your own reasons, I think it's better to not wear one, to just relate to other people as a human being, to see our faces. Um, you weren't allowed to decide that. It was decided for you. You just had to go with what the government said. And I think that's why I've said that masks are, are dehumanising and reductionist. You know, that they don't allow you to, to make the decision for what's best yourself for others 
They say, no, this is how you protect others. This is how you do what's best for others. You follow our rules and we will decide. And it takes that element of choice away. And, um, and, it, and it effectively reduces all human contact to one, to one thing, which is you know, rather than loving people, actually, no, you, your only goal is to protect them from COVID, basically, or, or one of the primary goals. Um, we've said a lot more about that before, so I won't go into that again. So I think uh, individualism and collectivism both have their problems. And the fundamental problem with both of them is balancing the needs of the one and the many. Because we do want to respect individual rights, but we also want to do what is best for the many, for society or uh, whatever group um, that we're talking about. So how do we do what is best for both, you know, both society and individuals? Does the Bible have any light to shed on this topic? And this is where I think the Bible has got some um, the most helpful thing to say, which kind of cuts across both individualism and collectivism. So the place to begin is where it says in, uh, in Genesis that we as human beings are made in the image of God. This is Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. You think about that for a second. Who is the us? What does it mean to be made in God's image? And what does it mean to be made, uh, if you like, you know, in our image, as God says? Well, this is what I learnt if you like, a summary of the Trinity at, uh, at Bible College. The Trinity is, from eternity, a perfect community of other person-centred love. The Trinity is a community of love, rather than God simply being a unity, a, a one with no uh, distinction. The Trinity is a community of love. And this is why some people have said, and, and unfortunately, I, I, I'm not sure of the origins of this quote, um, so I don't want to steal it and claim it as mine. But this is what someone has said. Philosophers have debated for centuries about what comes first, the one or the many. The Trinity brilliantly answers both. So how does the Trinity solve the problem of the individual or the collectivist? The Trinity encompasses both distinction and unity. So you think about it that there is uh, God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. So there are three distinct persons in the Godhead and yet there is unity. There is one God. They are one in purpose. They are one in, in mind, you know, one in will and so on. The Father wills and the Son wills what the Father wills. So what we see in the Trinity is a unity in diversity. The Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father and Son, and yet they are one. They, not by kind of eliminating their, not by eliminating their distinction, but actually by love, by loving one another and that love being poured out on the others. And the Trinity is a model for human society. I think this is the thing that, you know, we are made in the image of God. And actually, I think we have some clues from Jesus. Uh, for example, this is what he prayed in uh, in John's Gospel. This is the what, what's sometimes called Jesus's high priestly prayer towards the end of John. John chapter 17, verse 11, where he says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. So that they may be one as we are one. That's what Jesus prays. And that is the purpose of human society, to kind of, to model, if you like, God. Um, in the sense that, you know, we are to, to, in the image of God, you know, we are to love one another. And we are to show what God is like by the way that we love one another. And we look to each other's interests. So the Trinity is like a model for human society. It gives space for both our individuality 
and our togetherness. So this has clear implications for what we think about uh, collectivism or individualism. So God made us as unique individuals with uh, different gifts and skills and experiences and interests and so on. So we are made as individuals and God gave you all of your individual gifts and everything. But God also made us to live in a society where those skills would be needed. So God put us as individuals where we are as part of a society where we could fit in and where we could use the things that we have to benefit others. The image that the Bible uses in the New Testament is a body. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is a um, the chapter in the Bible, I suppose, which talks about this the most, which talks about um, a body with many parts, you know, one body with many parts, which each have a different function. That's kind of like the image that Paul uses to talk about it. So let me quote you a little bit from that chapter. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord there are different kinds of working, but in all of them, and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now just pause for a moment there, think about that. He's talked about the Spirit, the Lord, Jesus, and God, the Father, in, that, in those two uh, sentences. So already we kind of see that that's, the Godhead is coming into this. Um, that, you know, it's God working Father, Son, and Spirit in, in unity. And then Paul goes on, uh, now to each one, the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good. So that's what he's saying, that we are all given gifts as individuals, but the gifts that we are given as individuals are for the common good. So you're not given a gift just for yourself alone, but you are given that gift so that you can use it to benefit others. So some people, for example, if you're given the gift of being a good uh, musician, for example, you could uh, make money for yourself from music, um, but you can also uh, use it in, in church or whatever to benefit others with the music that you play. It's a blessing on others to listen to that music and, you know, you can, you can add enjoyment and, and what have you to their lives and you can help them to worship, all of those kind of things. There are many, many different examples. You know, if you're given money, that's another gift. Uh, and and you know, the idea is not so that you can use it to build a bigger mansion for yourself, but so that you can use it to help others. Um, perhaps others who are struggling, or maybe you can use it to help with projects in the community, building a community centre, building a church, or building a hospital, whatever it may be. So those gifts are given to benefit others for the common good. That's the point of it. So I think then that Christianity critiques both individualism and collectivism. I think Christianity critiques individualism because it says that we are not atomized individuals pursuing goals independent of others. That's uh, you could be forgiven for thinking that as a as a society that's what we we were. We just want individuals to do whatever's best for them and forget about other people. That's not what Christianity says. That's not what the Bible says. Let me just read you a couple of Bible verses which talk about this. So Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So Paul says that we shouldn't put ourselves forward in, um, you know, vain conceit or selfish ambition, you know, looking to fulfil our own dreams at the expense of others. But we should look to the interests of others above ourselves. And the reason that we do that is because we serve a Lord, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who did just that. And this is what he says in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus gave his life for us, and that is our model as well, that we give our lives to him and lay it down for the sake of others. 
that is that's what Christianity is. So the model that Jesus gives us is one of of laying our lives down for the for God and to bless others. And the gifts that we are given are given as we saw um, just just a moment ago are given with duties and responsibilities to use them to benefit others so that God gives things to us so that we can give them to others if you like. Uh, so that's why Paul can say in Romans chapter 13 verse 10 love is the fulfillment of the law. That is the the key thing that everything God wants us to do is fulfilled in love that when we act actively kind of do what is right, what is loving, what is best for others, that we find our true purpose, not in selfish ambition, but in love. That's where we, uh, that's, that's how God made us to be. So I think Christianity critiques individualism, but I think Christianity also critiques collectivism. So it says, uh, Christianity says that we don't need to set aside our individuality to in order to love, but we can love with our uniqueness as individuals. So think about this, that you know, you're not an interchangeable human being, that all of your relationships are unique because they're relationships with you. Your friends do not see you as someone that they can just, you know, talk to anyone uh, that they could replace you with anyone but you are unique and you bring something unique and special and different to every relationship that's the lovely thing about human relationships that we're not interchangeable but you know we can love people and, and every relationship you have will be different to the one that you know um, to every other relationship if you like it will be unique it will be different and this is the fundamental thing it's about fitting us as individuals, as unique individuals, into the bigger part, not compromising our individuality, but actually, as we grow in individuality, as we grow in love, we grow more ourselves, but we also grow into being part of that community which God is making us into. And that's a sentiment which is beautifully expressed in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. He says, You also like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. I love the picture that he gives there, which is you, know, you, are, you are being built into a spiritual house like living stones. It's like God is taking you and putting you as part of a, a lovely, beautiful building, uh, like a temple. And it is pleasing to God as we you know, fulfill our part as, as part of that building and that every kind of contour, if you like, of your individual personality, your nature fits beautifully into the wall and, and fits perfectly with other people too. That's the way it's meant to be. That, and that's what happens when we look as individuals, when we look to others, when we look to love them and uh, rather than kind of having being subsumed as individuals into the collective, as individuals we love and that's what the christian message is now i realize that we've um this is um we don't really have time to go on and i'd love to go on i think what i'd like to do next time is to think about what this says about how we can actually start to do stuff in society because as as we saw um, you know, every society has to be kind of a balance of collectivist and individualist. But is there a way of doing society which is perhaps cuts across those individualist collectivist um, boundaries and actually helps to, uh, to to accomplish what the way that society is supposed to be? I think there might be, but I'm going to leave you on a bit of a cliffhanger there um, and maybe come back to that next week. And before that, we'll, uh, we'll look at our final uh, passage from the book of Romans and we'll finish the podcast looking at that. So let's finish then with a reflection from Romans chapter 3 and uh, picking up where we left off last week uh, one little paragraph at the end of Romans chapter 3 this is verses 27 to 31. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith 
apart from the works of the law? Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Okay, so Paul is talking, you may you may recall we've been talking about this uh, all the way through, about this tension between the Jews who thought they were righteous because they had the law, and what Paul is trying to say, which is that, no, you, you may have had the law, but you don't keep it. The problem is that no one keeps the law perfectly, and actually we need a righteousness which comes apart from the law. We need the righteousness that comes by faith rather than uh, through just simply the good things that we do by obeying the law because we can't achieve the, the standard which God requires through our own obedience. So he says then, where, where then is boasting? And I wonder if this is in response to what some of the people he'd been um, he'd heard from, from, from Rome, actually uh, were saying that, you know, they were saying, well, we are boasting because we are so good. It's a very, I mean, you can see this in human nature all the time, can't you? That people are proud when they think they, are, they obey. And I think you can see this in the, the so-called woke or the social justice warriors, you know, in, in, it's like saying, I, it's my virtue by, um, by, doing all of these things this activism and I actually make myself a better person because of it and that's why I think that this the sort of the modern kind of woke religion is a very legalistic religion it's a bit like how the Jews thought about themselves you know they thought you just have to do this x y and z and you'll get you know that will that will get you to to God that will you know get you God's approval and with the woke, you know, although they don't believe in, in God, uh, they, they do, well, um, I say quite a, quite a lot of them don't. I think, um, anyway, that's, yeah, let's leave that aside for the moment. But actually that they say, you know, you have to do this, that and the other. And it leads to this situation where, the, you know, there's a great deal of self-righteousness, of thinking that they are above others because they do these things perfectly. There is boasting, if you like. Because they think they have achieved it all through their own innate goodness and their own efforts, rather than actually seeing everyone as equal. And this is what, what Paul goes on to say. Paul says that there's only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. So he says that we all, every single one of us, needs that same faith in God to be justified. It's not about our obedience. It's only about our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, of course, that doesn't mean, and he'll go on to talk about this, that we can then avoid doing good things um, because that's, that's important, but actually that that's not how we are made right with God. And that means that we can't boast. There's a lovely quote which... I um, I often think of, I heard this at college, which is the ground is level at the foot of the cross. The cross is the great leveller, isn't it? And I, I often think about this in communion uh, when we take the bread and the wine at church, for example, that you know whether we are rich or poor, uh, whatever social group we come from, young or old, or wherever we come from, that we all need the same bread and the same wine and we all take it together. And we, it makes us one because that is how we do it. And actually thinking about what we were talking about with collectivism and so on, that actually it's the, the body and blood of Christ um, that, that make us one in the end, isn't it? As actually he forms us into the people that we, we should be as we are forgiven of our sins and as we uh, ask for his help and receive his his Holy Spirit to help us to kind of um, love others in the way that we should. Um, so Paul finishes then, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all, rather we uphold the law. He's saying, you know, that the, the law is a good thing. Yes, of course it is. It is, you know, yes, we do need to, to aspire to obey it. 
but he says that we mustn't boast about how well we obey it because we never can. You know that the yes, the law is a good thing, but we don't achieve uh, we don't achieve God's acceptance through obeying the law. And that's something that we must remember that actually it's, you know, if to be a Christian is not to look down on other people, but to be a Christian is to know that we are all equal before God and to know that we all equally need God's God's grace, forgiveness through Jesus Christ and that we come before him as as one in that respect, as one humanity, sinful, needing his forgiveness. And it's a message which is very, um, it's the antithesis, I think, of a lot of the, the woke uh, religion, which is very legalistic. And, and I think there's a lot of pride and boasting in there because people think that they've achieved it all themselves. But the, the Christian faith gives no grounds for pride. It gives no grounds for boasting because we have to lay that down at the cross and say it's not through my own merits, but only through Christ. That is the important thing. Uh, let's take a moment to uh, to finish now and, and ask for God's help as we pray, uh, as we pray as we close. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do uh, thank you, Lord, that uh, you make us one through uh, through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And we pray that you would help us to have that mindset of not boasting, uh, not looking down on others, but instead to um, be able to see others through your eyes and know that uh, we all must have that same faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, we pray that you would help us as, a, uh, as a, a church, as a society, to play our part uh, as individuals in loving one another and in doing um, what is right for the benefit of others. We know, Lord, that this is a hard thing that you ask, um, but we pray that you would give us grace and give us wisdom to be able to love others and uh, to put the needs of others above ourselves. And we pray, Lord, that you would help uh, as a society, that you would help uh, those who are in need, those who are suffering injustice, to receive the justice that they really need. And we thank you that you are a God of justice and that you care. And we pray that you will accomplish this, um, Lord, as we watch and as we wait, that you would achieve justice for those who who are treated unjustly. So we do commit uh, all of this to you, Lord, and pray that you would uh, help us to see more of your ways and that your light would shine more and more across our land and across our world. And ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for watching or listening to this. If you're on YouTube, don't forget to do the like and subscribe. If you're on the podcast, why not give me a rating, uh, even a review, as that does help other people to find the show. And um, you can support me if you'd like to on Buy Me A Coffee. I'm sort of freelance, so I do appreciate uh, your support in that respect too. If you'd like to get in touch, then you can do that on Telegram. Uh, the link will be down below. You can email me through sacredmusingspod at gmail.com or just leave a comment below. And um, yeah, um, I'd just like to say thank you to the person who um, who was um, got in touch via Twitter uh, after my last podcast. And I think that sort of helped inspire me to talk about uh, collectivism today as well. So uh, I do listen. Uh, so thanks so much, everyone. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. But in the meantime, God bless.